growing up, you had no plumbing. I, I don't think you had a, a toilet, no shower. You had heat only from the, the stove. What do you think not having much growing up taught you about money? Well, I think uh, more importantly is that growing up like the way I did, poor and with none of those luxuries, all of those things, uh, you know, made you much more hungry for success. So when you grow up like that, you don't shy away from anything. I mean, working to me was kind of like never, oh my God, I have to work. I loved working. If it was in bodybuilding or making an endorsement here or an investment in an apartment building or starting a mail order business or getting into movies or doing this or doing that, it's like, wow, this is really amazing. But it took a lot of hard work, but I never shied away from work. And I think that my hunger and my desire and my fire in the belly and that nothing could stop me. I think that comes from growing up the way I did. Whether directly or indirectly, what do you think your father taught you about work ethic? Well, my father was kind of like, you know, a plus and a minus. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that we, you, my father really contributed a lot to my hunger. And my father contributed for me to wanting to get away from Austria and to get away from home because, you know, they were not like, come on Arnold, stay, you can stay as long as you want. No, with 15, I already had to pay to live at home. I mean, I made 300 shilling a month uh, as an apprentice and 100 shilling I had to give my parents so I could get the food. I mean, not that the food was not worth much more than 100 sh shilling, but they made me contribute and I hated that. I said to myself, this is uncalled for, because my friends didn't have to do that. You know, so it was, it was that kind of a thing. So I said, I'm going to get away as fast as I can. I will show you guys. In order. So it gave me the motivation to just leave and get out of there. You wrote, I mean, I read your book, and it, it was great. Um, you made a pointed comment about your dad in your book. You said, um, quote, every time he hit me, every time he said my weight training was garbage, that I should do something useful and go out and chop wood, Every time he disapproved of me or embarrassed me, it put fuel on the fire in my belly. That's right. Why? It was, it was, the, it was that upbringing. So this is why I said there's the plus and then the, the, the minus. So the, the minus was the immediate effect that it had, that uh, I felt like there was never really a compliment. There was never really honored you did well on this. There was never, uh, you know, kind of like, where he was supportive of my weight training or supportive of my ideas or of my craziness or of my dreams or anything like that. It was always kind of like, uh, you can do better. So it was always kind of that, uh, I mean, there was, every so often was a compliment, but this was not all negative. But I, I tell you, the majority of times it was negative. And uh, so, the reason why I say that there is a plus and minus because there was the minus, but the positive is, is that is what gave me the, the, the fire in the belly. So the more you, you, you kind of create resistance uh, the person, the stronger that person gets and the stronger your character gets and the more you can endure in the end. So for that, I thank the world of what my father did. But I don't think that was maybe the intentions. He was just that he was always kind of a tough guy, a military guy. He helped me to get into the military and to become a tank driver. So there was those sides also where he was very helpful. But he just, re he meant so well, and he meant to push me and to make me better in athletics and to make me better in school and to make me better as a person and to always talk about being useful and don't waste your time on just looking at yourself in the mirror in a bodybuilding gym. So he meant well, but the way it came out, the, the immediate effect was uh, quite different. You seem to have had a unique relationship with tanks uh, over the years. What do you remember from the time you started up a tank in the garage? Well, first of all, let me just tell you that my fascination with tanks and with big trucks comes from that when I grew up as a kid, 
we were occupied by the British. It was after the Second World War. And so there were tanks driving by our house and big trucks driving by, soldiers jumping out and uh, surveying the area and looking through the binoculars and jumping back in again and all this. And always kind of uh, were very sweet to us kids. You know, they kind of pulled us up on the, on the tank and we could stand on the tank and, you know, kind of play around and they would give us candies. So they were trained because they were the occupiers. They were trained on how to really reach out to the community and not make them, make us look at them as in a hostile way. And they were very good at it. And so but I saw this monster tank. So, so when I grew up and when I went into the army, you know, I said, I want to be a tank driver. But at the same time, you know, I was, not a 21-year-old guy, I went in, into the ar army early. I was at the age of 18. So I was an 18-year-old kid, still really not yet ripe enough, I would say, to take on the responsibility of a 50-ton tank. But there I was, I was going through tank driving school and I uh, passed uh, you know, easily, was very, very excited, enthusiastic, studied everything about the tank, and then there I had my own tank. And I started driving the tank, and it was wonderful, and information driving and all this stuff. But there were accidents that happened. Um, and uh, one of them, for instance, was like I was inside the garage and did my daily routine of warming up the tank. So which means that you, you get into the tank, you crawl in, and then you pull the lever on the bottom of the, of the seat, and the, the, the seat goes down, zhoom. So now you're gone now below. Um, you can't really see out, <clears throat> and now you're looking at the gauges, and you're, you're turning on the engine and the gauges, and you check out and so to make sure the oil warms up and the engine warms up, and all of the stuff before you drive it. You're supposed to check that the hand brakes are on. You're supposed to check that the gear is out, and all. This. But that's of course stuff that I was too busy thinking about, and so I just ran this engine, and somehow I got into the reverse gear. And then started, you know, the car started, the, 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 the tank started, you know, shaking. And I said to myself, this is kind of odd. I'm sitting out in this, and this is shaking. And then all of a sudden, you know, I, and I'm trying to switch things around. And then all of a sudden, I felt dust coming down from the top. And then all of a sudden, I felt water. And then I smelled gas. And so I literally ran with my tank through the building, through the wall and broke the gas pipes and the water pipes and everything that was there and bricks were coming, falling down and everything like that. So then I stopped and I realized that I was in deep trouble. So I stopped, I got out of my tank, I looked around and I said, oh shit, <laughs> this is trouble. <laughs> so I said to myself, wait a minute, there was an officer right down in the corner that the day this morning gave me these unbelievable compliments. He says, Schwarzenegger, you're fantastic. You're a great tank driver and all this kind of stuff. And I said, maybe I have to go back to him now. He will have sympathy. He likes me. So I went back to him and I said, uh, you know, sorry, but I had this little accident. Can you check it out? He said, ah, don't worry about it, Schwarzenegger. Yeah, yeah. And he walked out of the thing. <laughs> he had no idea what I meant by a little accident. I thought that, that I just went into driving into a can or something like that. And he looked like this, and he started screaming. I mean, he started screaming. He didn't stop. He almost died. He almost got a heart attack. This is how, how he freaked out. So anyway, <laughs> so it was incidences like that that, um, that were not pretty. And uh, so I had my fair share of accidents with the tank. I, I want to take you back to when you were growing up. Explain how you had a revelation about your future career during a class essay writing assignment. Well, uh, in, in uh, school, we had always, you know, there was like music one day, and then there was uh, guest speakers another day, and then there was documentaries that they would show. And it was usually so like uh, eight millimeter documentaries, uh, black and white. And um, I remember that I saw on a screen, you know, uh, footage of New York and uh, the high rises and by a state building. I saw, you know, the, the, the highways and freeways and the bridges and everything seemed to me 
so huge. It was like gigantic. I mean, in Austria, when you live in this little village, uh, you know, you see everything little, little bridges, little cars, little four-cylinder cars, you know, one-cylinder motorcycles and mopeds and stuff like that. But there it was the Harley Davidson, this huge motorcycle, the huge Cadillacs with the wings and all this stuff. So everything was just gigantic. And um, I just fell in love with that. And I said to myself, I got to get to America. But I always, for some reason or the other, felt that I was in the wrong place. Why? I always, I always felt out of place in Austria. I felt kind of like, um, I mean, it was a beautiful country and everything. But it was kind of like I felt like it's too little for me. Um, I was much more attracted to America. I felt that, you know, maybe... Even at an early age? At a very early age, yes. It was almost kind of like, uh, it was one of those weird things, you know, this, maybe I'm, I'm the child of some American soldier of some sort. You know, there was something, some, something going on, you know, that somehow I, I belonged to America. And um, so I don't know why, but that's just the way it was. And... Um, and so I had this urge of coming to America. So I just couldn't figure out how. And so that's why I think I started with bodybuilding also, because it was a very American sport. And I felt like, well, you know, if I really do well in bodybuilding, and if I could become like one of those guys, like Steve Reeves or Reg Park, then I would be eventually invited to come to America and compete over there or whatever, the movies, whatever. I had my own little fantasy. So there was always ways that I had to figure out how can I get to America. Well, bodybuilding eventually was the way to take it to America. Describe the significance of getting the telegram from Joe Weider. Well, I I, um, I won a Mr. You know, like I said, Junior Mr. Europe. Then I won Mr. Europe the next year. Then I came second in the Mr. Universe competition. I was run up with the age of 19. Then I became Mr. Universe, the youngest Mr. Universe, with the age of 20. And then Joe Weider started putting me on a cover of his magazines. And I've heard from uh, friends of mine uh, in England that he has been acquiring about and trying to get information about me. And should he bring me over to America and, and all that? I said to myself, this is really great. I mean, this is the publisher of all the magazines around the world that get translated in all these different languages. We had it in Austria and in Germany also at the Weider magazine in German. And, uh, that was kind of the Bible of yeah, bodybuilding. Yeah, it was the, the Bible of bodybuilding. It was the, the, the magazine, you know? So I felt like, this is really great. This guy is trying to get information about me and he wants to bring me over. I said, this could really work. I mean, my plan, my master plan is uh, becoming a reality. And um, sure enough, with the age of 21, when I won the second Mr. Universe title, all of a sudden, I got a telegram. And uh, the telegram was just basically said, we want to welcome you and uh, you know, invite you and, and welcome you in America at the Mr. Universe contest in Florida, which is next week. So I said to myself, this is fantastic. So I uh, got you know, everyone to help so I can get the visa as quickly as possible and then come to America and compete in America at the Mr. Universe competition. And I knew when I packed my gym bag in Munich, where I was living at the time, uh, that I would never come back. This apartment would never see me again. You and, knew it. Uh, so yeah, I knew it, yeah. So I packed my gym bag, just had very little in there, just you know, few little things that you need for a few days of traveling to England. And, um, um, and I just had that bag, continued on to, to the United States, never went back, and uh, stayed there, and never came back to the uh, to Europe. Only on visits and, uh, and and working on movies and stuff like that, but not really moving back. When you were in your early twenties, why did you always feel your future was in business, and how much easier did you find it to start a business in the states? Well, you know, some people are born with a certain talent. And I don't know why I had a, uh, a feel for business, to make you know, money and to, uh, I was never shy of working. I always loved working and I always kind of was good in figuring out on how to make money. 
And even when I was a little kid at the age of 13, I was working at various different places and making my money uh, so I could buy my gym uh, outfits, I could buy my training shoes, I could uh, buy myself a bicycle and all of those things. I never had to ask my parents. First of all, my parents would have never bought it for me because they didn't have the money. Um, and so I bought it myself. I went to work and I figured out how to make the money and how to make them pay me a lot of times as a grown-up, even though I was like a 13 or 14 year old kid, but they loved the idea so much like at some factory, I would work in a glass factory where I just sweep up glass and, you know, and, and get rid of it. And, uh, you know, they will pay me as uh, a grown-up. I mean, you've been on the business front involved with everything from owning a 747 to construction to a mail-order business to real estate. What have you found, obviously outside of acting, that you've had most success in over the years? I was very fortunate in real estate, for instance. Uh, uh, but again, it's, it, you know, you have a nose for it or you don't. But you, you, have the, I mean, you were a young kid who was just over in the States and you're just starting to make money in investing, like it seemed like every dollar you could into real estate. Like how, how did you, like, I would you save, know? I would save every single dollar that I made. And I didn't make much money at all. But I would save every single dollar that I made. If I did a seminar somewhere or a posing exhibition, um, or my mail order business uh, that I started really little. Um, I would save everything. And I remember that when I had $26,000 or whatever it was, I had in cash in the bank. And um, I was looking around like a fanatic for a uh, apartment building. And I felt very strongly that before I ever buy an apartment, a condominium, or a house, I got to have income property first. Hmm. So, and what, was, what happened was is that I bought then eventually a six unit apartment building, and in the front it had the owner's unit, which was like double the size of all the other apartments. So that was perfect for me. So there I had my, my apartment, and I had an apartment building, and I remember I bought that apartment building for two hundred and thirty-five or two hundred and forty thousand dollars, and then you know two or three years later we sold it like for double. And uh, so I made with this twenty-six thousand dollars basically, you know, a hundred and fifty thousand dollars, almost two hundred thousand dollars profit. So think about what percentage of profit is over a period of just three years. Right. So 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 this to me was very clear. But you know I had I had the courage to do it to, to take all my money and that there was not one single dollar left and put it in the end of this investment. And that's what I always did. And eventually I had like, you know, a hundred plus apartments uh, and um, I had a great business and this was way before. And then offices also started investing in offices on Main Street in Santa Monica. And so before I ever did a, a, a film or got really heavily into the film business, I already was a millionaire from the real estate deals that I've made and for all the success that I had in, in real estate. What do you recall from the call you got after you made an appearance on Merv Griffin? Well, first of all, I think it was terrific that I was able, through my personality, to pass all of those pre-interviews when I did the talk show. Because when you do a talk show the first time, you know, they want to do a pre-interview to see if you really can talk on the talk show and open up your mouth or do you freeze and not say anything. Uh, and, and so this, I, I passed through those kind of pre-interviews very easily. And so when I did the first Murph Griffin show, which was Shaggy Green, that was the interviewer, he was the guest host. Uh, and he is a great comedian and very funny guy. And I think because he's a funny guy, he kind of turned me on when I was out there on that show to make me also funny and full of life and, and all that. And uh, he complimented me during the show and all that. And it was, it was really terrific. So that I was funny on that show, and so the next day, I got a phone call from Lucille Ball, and she said that I'm doing happy anniversary and goodbye with Art Carney and with so and so and so and so. And she mentioned all the, the names, Academy Award winning uh, guys and uh, very famous women uh, in that TV show. And she said, I want you to be doing a guest spot. I want you to play the masseur, the Italian masseur. 
I think it will be fantastic with your body. And you are so funny. Arnold, you were so funny at that Murph Griffin show. We were laughing. I was sitting there with my husband and we were, uh, and we were laughing. And uh, we wanted you to come in and to read for this part. And she's as big of a star as there was. She, was, a, she was the, you know, 800-pound gorilla. There's no, no two ways about it. I mean, she was like the monster of the entertainment industry, you know. Uh, also, as a woman in those days, that was very unique to have someone be that powerful. And you rehearsed with her for a, a week. You obviously get the job. Uh, take me to the live taping. Well, I, my English was not yet that good. So I remember that she kept uh, saying the whole week when we rehearsed, she says, now you have to project more, you have to project more. I didn't really understand what project more means. You know, so, uh, but every day when we rehearsed, she kept saying project, and you know, I wanted it to be louder, and blah, 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 and all this. And this is great, you're doing really well on it, and all that stuff, she says. And then she said, you know, because on Friday, or on Monday when we're shooting, we're shooting live. And then I said, I said, okay, great. I had no idea what she meant by life. And uh, so I remember when in the, the day, and we did again a re little rehearsal before, and she says, now we're gonna go and uh, go through the whole thing again. Your part will come up in an hour and 17 minutes and blah, blah, blah. I said, okay. So then they took me out and they said, when you see the green light there, that's when you go and ring the doorbell. And that's when you go in, just like we always did. And so I rang the doorbell, and then I heard her already on the other side, yeah, who is it, who, who is that, who is it, you know? And then she opened up the door, and then I, you know, I said, uh, hi, my name is you know, Joe Sando, and I'm the masseur, and all of a sudden, I'm uh, hearing this huge applause. And so I'm looking out, and I'm realizing there's a live audience. <laughs> it was packed. It was packed. And she luckily saved my butt because she says, well, don't just stand around here with your massage table there. I mean, just uh, do something. Because you're I mean, frozen. Yeah, I, I, I'm now looking at this audience, kind of looking around and say, wait a minute, son of a bitch, you never told me that there is <laughs> going to be an audience. But of course she said it's live, but I did not know what that meant. You know, so I just it went, like I said, over my head. It was so much fun doing this scene, but it all kind of like started from doing the Murph Griffin show and getting the attention from her because of the show and because of my personality. I am Rico. Oh, y yes. Well, won't you go? Oh, you are in. <laughs> the best advice she ever gave you would be what? Well, I think that she uh, always talked about how difficult it is to break into Hollywood and how to have a positive attitude and to just, you know, study hard and uh, not to listen to the naysayers and all those kind of things. And the, the most amazing thing about Lucille Ball was, as tough as she was, she was really a sweetheart of a woman. Inside, there was just a heart that was beyond belief because every single project I did, I remember after that I did Stay Hungry, she wrote me a letter and said, I'm proud of you, I saw the movie, we just loved it, you're such a great actor, and we're so happy that we were the ones that got you started. And then I went and did Pumping On, she would write a letter again, and when I did the, you know, the villain with Kirk Douglas, she wrote me a letter, I mean, Conan, I mean, she really was on top of it, you know, until she passed away, uh, always extremely supportive. Terminator, who was pretty much signed up to play the role when you first heard about it? Well, when I got involved, uh, I remember they told me that it was O.J. Simpson was the Terminator. And I was supposed to play Reese. And then um, I was asked to have lunch with James Cameron and to talk about the movie and, uh, you know, let's just hope that everything goes well because uh, Jim needs to sign off for you to play Reese and to play the hero. And um, as I was sitting there and having lunch, for some reason or the other, I started talking more and more about the Terminator. What? Well, when I read it, it just happens to be that not too long ago, I saw the movie Westworld, 
with Joe Brenner, who played a machine. And uh, he played this, the toughest of the toughest. You know, Joe Brenner is a fantastic actor. And he did the, played a fantastic, the, the, the toughest kind of cowboy and the uh, shooter. And when he was in the bar, and I saw him, the way he acted, but there was, everything was kind of off because it was not like a human being, but you couldn't identify really, there's something wrong here, but you couldn't identify exactly what it was until later on when you saw that at night they took them apart and they fixed the machines. I said, that's what it was. I knew the way his eye movement was, the way his head was kind of a little bit more jerky and every move was a little off. So I remember all that. And I was fascinated by that because I've never seen that on film, someone acting like a machine. So I told James Cameron, I said, look, there's this one thing that you got to make sure of is that, 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 that whoever plays Terminator, and I heard it's O.J. Simpson, I said, but whoever plays it, I said, you got to train them to be a machine. Not to act like a machine, to be a machine. He said, what do you mean? And I said, well, I said, for instance, I said, there's scenes in there with, with guns and weapons. I said, he cannot go and look down and have the magazine be put into the gun or look down when he puts the bullets into the magazine and all of this stuff. I said, he has, this has to be done like a machine. So therefore, he has to train himself blindfolded. He cannot see what he's doing so that while he's talking, he has to be going on and put it away, you know, just everything automatic. The way he steps on the motorcycle, there's not looking down on the stand to get the stand. None of that can happen. So I kept talking like that the whole lunch, very enthusiastically, like an expert. <laughs> so at the end of the lunch, he says, he says well, first of all, I totally agree with everything you say. He says, but I have to say one thing. I said, there's no one that will understand the Terminator better than you. He says, so therefore, I think, I think we're all in agreement that you should play the Terminator. I said, no, Jim, excuse me. I said, I don't want to regress in my career. I said, because this guy only talks, says 27 lines. I said, I don't want to go backwards. I said, I just did Conan, I did this, and I did Conan number two. I said, I, I want to have the, the other part where there's much more dialogue and much more challenging and those. He says, trust me, I will shoot the character so that you're not only the number one villain that they've ever seen, but the number one hero. Just the way I shoot it, I know exactly how to do that. And I said, no, 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 no. He says, well, you don't have to answer now. He says, take your time. Let me know in the next few days. So, of course, I go home with it from that point on, all I thought about is visualizing myself as Terminator and then as Reese and all this back and forth. And then eventually one day I woke up and I said to myself, you know, he's right. It will be the most memorable character if it's played right. And I promised Mr. that I'm gonna go and study it and I'm gonna play it right and I'm gonna be the Terminator. Explain your idea for the Terminator to get a little drunk and your issue with I'll be back. Well, you know, I just uh, saw uh, uh, E.T. And I thought that it was a, such an appealing scene when E.T. goes to the refrigerator and drinks something and it happens to be alcohol and then gets a little smashed. And it's all over the place. I thought it was very endearing and very funny. So I said to myself, um, I would be funny actually if the Terminator, you know, being this machine, but he gets smashed a little bit drinking alcohol. But of course I didn't thank as deeply as Jim Cameron did when he wrote the script. Because when you write a script, you really got to understand the character. 100%, otherwise you screw up. And so he came to me and says, Arnold, first of all, he says, you're a machine. Machines don't get drunk, okay? So let's, but this is, uh, no one knows that we're having this discussion. He looked around always and he says, number two, don't tell me how to write my script, okay? I don't tell you how to act. And you don't tell me how to write. <laughs> so this is how we kind of settled that conversation very quickly. And the very same funny. with the I'll be back. Oh, yeah, I mean, the, I'll yeah, be yeah. back. I mean, there was like a, a, but that was an argument in front of people. Because said, oh, there was. I said, I, I, Jim, I said, to, to, to me, I'll be back. It, this sounds weak. I say, I will be back. And he said, no, he said, just say, I'll be back. And I said, but when I say I'll, this, oh, I'll, 
I said, it's, it's, it's weak. It does not sound like a machine. I said, I would say, I will be back. And he says, just say, I'll be back. God damn it, he says, don't rewrite my script. You know, just say it. You know, then we, we agreed that he would um, shoot it, um, you know, do 10 takes and uh, let me choose the take. And that's exactly what we did. We then said it 10 times, the different ways, more dramatic, less dramatic, and all this kind of stuff, and then we picked one. With the movie Twins, and obviously this turned out to be an amazing decision, but what led you at the time to deciding to take no salary? Well, you have to understand, I was so convinced that I would be great in a comedy. But I also understood the dilemma that the studios were in. Because the studios saw me, every time I do a movie, the movies make huge money. So it was natural to offer me another action movie to play safe. Let's get another action movie for Schwarzenegger. The last one did great. Let's take, let's take him this time to the jungle. You're let's right. take him to Russia. Let's take him there and let's take him there. It was like, the, the, you know, so it was all working fantastic. Let's have him be a machine. So it was like, whatever it was, let's be an action movie and it would do well. And you were hypersensitive about being typecast. Well, I wasn't hypersensitive. I was just, I said to myself, I understand that this is what the audience wants me to do. Me to go out and to kick ass and to be the guy that is, you know, wiping out evil and all the bad people and all the stuff and that I protect everyone else and I'm the good guy and all this kind of stuff. So I understood that. So I felt like that the only way that we maybe can go beyond that and make a studio feel at all comfortable is just by me just saying, hey, you don't have to be the only one that is investing in me. I invest in myself too. Don't give me any money, nothing. Just pay for the production and does it, you know. Uh, and so that's what I basically said to Ivan Reitman. And when Ivan Reitman and I had, uh, you know, dinner in Aspen and Snowmass uh, with Robin Williams, and uh, that's where he actually Ivan Reitman, the director of Ghostbusters, uh, said, You are funny, and there's so many things about you that I've never seen in a movie. He says, I would like to see that in a movie. And I said, Ivan, why don't you go and come up with a project for us? I said, you've just done Ghostbusters. I said, I would love to, do, to be directed by you in a comedy. I said, but no one wants, wants to do a comedy with me because I'm the action star. And he says, OK, let me come up with something. And he said, he came up with five ideas. And we picked out of those five ideas uh, uh, the idea of uh, the experiment, which then was changed to twins. And, um, you know, so I understood that, uh, that the studio shouldn't be the one uh, responsible for taking the risk. So we, we were able to then make the deal very easily because Danny DeVito decided not to take a salary. Ivan Reitman decided not to take a salary. And I decided not to take one. But that we take a big chunk of the back end. And of course, that was the best investment we've ever made. Every one of us says that because uh, the studio never, ever it became such a historic deal that the studio would never, ever make that deal again. Really? No matter who it is. No, absolutely not. Because they each got, got a percentage well, of the profits. They, 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 we, we got the bigger chunk. And that does not f uh, float well with the studio, let me tell you. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I remember that uh, whoever the studio executive was then, uh, after the movie came out and after we made all the money, he says, you know what you guys did to me? And uh, he turned around and he uh, pulled out his pockets and he says, you know, you robbed me blind and you f me. You know, and he bent over like that. <laughs> and so that's, that's uh, exactly and so, so uh, you know, it was, uh, like I said, a historic deal. But for $16.5 million, that's what the budget was of the movie because we do no salary. Otherwise, it would have been uh, $50 million, you know, because Ivan was getting a huge salary. Danny was, and I was getting a huge salary at that point. So we just, you know, didn't take any because there was a very low budget uh, for this kind of a movie. And it made, I think, worldwide uh, 260, 270 million dollars. So I mean, it was a huge, huge winner. What happened after filming True Lies that 
made you realize you needed a heart operation? First of all, when you talk about the heart operation, my mother had a heart problem. And so I took her to UCLA one day, this was in the late 70s, where they told her that she has a valve problem. As a matter of fact, two of her valves didn't really work well. And that she may down the line need a, a valve replacement. And they also told her, they asked her, I said, did your mother or someone in your family have that? And uh, she said, which was the first time I kind of heard that was, yeah, my mother had a valve problem and she died with the age of 67. And so they said, they said, well, you know, it's obviously something that is being passed down. I said, Arnold, you better get your heart checked regularly because this could also happen to you. And so from that point on, every year, I had my heart checked when I had my physical. And uh, so when I was finished with, uh, with uh, True Lies, I remember the doctor at that physical said, you know, the time is coming up where I see your heart, the performance going down, that you need soon a valve replacement. So I said to them, I said, well, you know, why don't I just do, uh, let's do it in two years from now. And he says, that's fine. So right after the Batman and Robin movie, I went into the hospital and uh, got uh, the, the valve replacement, got both valves replaced, the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve. What was the risk involved with that? And what did the doctor come into your room and say at 3 a.m. the morning after surgery? Well, because I got the ROS procedure, which is where they take one of your own valves and put it in, a, in the aortic uh, uh, position. Uh, so the pulmonary valve is really normally not strong enough to, to, to take over the aortic position and to that uh, pressure, blood pressure. So he, it was clear that at that point, there's a 60% chance that it works and the 40% chance that it won't work. So what happened was is that it, the, the, the pressure was too enormous and my body was too big and too strong. And, um, and it also didn't help that right after I woke up from the surgery, I went on the life cycle and started riding the life cycle with all the machines you know, still connected to me. So that didn't help either. But I mean, it's a, but the bottom line was that it failed and that, that uh, I started coughing and I, I, I started kind of you know, choking and not getting any air and uh, there was fluid going in the lungs and all this. And at three in the morning, the doctor came to me and said, you know, the surgery failed that in two hours from now, we have to do it again. And now, now it gets very dangerous. Because to do two surgeries within uh, 24 hours like that, you know, it's like, uh, first they tell you there's a 6% chance of failure that you wipe out, and now all of a sudden that doubles, goes to 12%. So I don't have to tell you that if you have a, a gun to your head that has, uh, you know, a hundred chambers and there's 12 bullets in there. I don't think anyone wants to take the risk when you spin it that, that you know, it's going to be clean. So, so it was, it was a, a wild thing to be, a, a, a situation to be in. But being on the amount of drugs that you're on the, uh, at that point, you really don't care. You know, it's like, I say, okay, we'll just do it. And, Did uh, you think there was a chance that could be it? Yeah, absolutely. It was a disastrous situation to be in, nevertheless, and I could see when they prepped me for the surgery uh, at five in the morning that their attitude was quite different than the day before when they prepped me for the first surgery. But it was all kind of like easy going and like the dancing around and being funny. They're all in the operation room with the music is on and all that stuff. This time it was serious, serious business. I could feel that even though I was high on drugs. And uh, so luckily it all turned out well. And he did, uh, Dr. Starnes did a great job in uh, redoing it. And uh, now 19 years later, I still have the same valves and everything is standing fine. Bush Sr., uh, how neat was it when he was in office to pretty much have an open invitation to come to the White House whenever you were in DC? Well, first of all, let me just say that I met a lot of politicians, obviously, in my life. And there is nothing that I've ever met, Democrat or Republican alike, that ever comes close to uh, Bush one. Uh, he was a very unique man, 
He is a very unique man and he uh, was just extremely gracious and his mannerism and everything was just like a gentleman. So then when I became the chairman of the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports, um, I had great access always to the Ober office and he would bring me in and he would have me hang out and, and, and then explain to me everything. And that was kind of a point where I started really getting turned on to politics and to, wow, it would be great for me one day to do something like that. And, um, and then I, I was invited up to Camp David, um, I mean, a lot of times. He wanted me up there, I mean, all the time. Really? Oh, he called me and the White House called me and Barbara called us and invited us up there and uh, they just were fantastic. They loved going up to Camp David. And so we went up there in the summertime, in the spring, fall, winter, sledding up there and uh, skiing and trap shooting, horseshoes. I mean, we would do sports literally all day long. I was so exhausted. <laughs> I can't, and he just was like, he just uh, was really athletic. I mean, he was really in shape, that guy. And then on Sunday, I remember a lot of the people came up there and then they worked, did a lot of work and stuff like that. And then of course it was uh, also uh, getting, at, at one point it was getting very close to the Iraqi war and I was, had the chance to watch that whole thing unfold. And um, you had so a front was, row seat for some yeah, serious business. For, for a lot business of the meetings, exactly. There, right? yeah. So it was just fantastic to watch it. But he was like the kindness that he displayed, and uh, and he really also noticed that I was very passionate about fitness. And so he, when I asked him to do the Great American Workout in front of the at the South Lawn of the White House, in front of the White House, just like Kennedy used to do in the '60s when he had you know, sports th activities in the spring, always in the, it was kind of a fitness day, uh, to redo that and to do this kind of idea, but bigger. And, um, you know, and even though every lawyer in his White House said no, uh, when I went to him and I said, look, there's too many no's here, I mean, it's like crazy. I, I don't even know how you get things done around here. And he says, let me talk to them. But then all of a sudden he made it happen. And so every year we had the Great American Workout, usually on, on, on the 1st of May. And it was all because he believed in me and he knew that I would stage the greatest American workout in front of the White House with all the press there and, 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 and sports celebrities and uh, different stations and exercises and different sports and all this, that he could be proud of the event. President Nixon, explain the situation that led to him actually being the first person to seriously suggest you one day run for governor? Yeah, I um, can't remember exactly the year it was, but I mean, uh, I was invited down to come to the Nixon Library, and, um, and I always felt kind of like he was the one that made me become a Republican because when he was campaigning in 1968, just when I came to America, there was a month of campaign still left to November because it was uh, in October when I came over to America. I had a friend of mine that uh, spoke German and English. They translated for me the debates and the, the, the discussions and everything like that. And whenever I heard Humphrey talk about uh, politics, uh, it sounded to me like, you know, I'm back in Austria, socialism, you know, give away everything and, uh, you know, have government be involved in everything and all this stuff. And they say, oh, wait, uh, that's not what we need. I just came from that. And uh, when Nixon talked, it was refreshing, you know, talking about, you know, the world is, 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 is uh, our, you know, business place and we should trade around the world and we should sell our goods around the world and we should have, uh, you know, at the world sell their stuff to, to us and uh, open up the borders and talking about get the military strong and law enforcement strong, law enforcement, and I love that, and get government off your back. I said, wow, that sounds really great, you know, lower the taxes, that sounds also great, you know, and, and on and on. So whatever he said, it just sounded fantastic. And I said to myself, so, uh, you know, so I, I, I said to myself, I said, what party is he from? And my friend said, my friend was a Democrat, and he says, oh, it's disgusting, he says, he's a Republican. And I said, well, you know something, 
then I'm a Republican. I say, because I love what this guy says. So I always contributed me becoming a Republican, uh, Nixon. You know, and he was the one that really turned me on and that really articulated it the right way. Um, and so when I was invited to the Nixon Library, of course I jumped at the opportunity. And then I heard when I got there that actually Nixon is going to be there. And I said, wow, this is wild. And uh, so I went there and it didn't take long. They brought me over to him and they introduced me to him. And then uh, he started uh, talking to me very enthusiastically and he was excited to meet me. And then he talked to me for another five minutes alone in his office. And it was fantastic, the conversation and everything. And then he said to me, he says, you know, um, you have political instinct, he says. You should run for governor out of nowhere. Now, like I said, this was way before I ever thought about doing anything in politics. And so then he was told that he should go and give a toast. And it was, you know, it was packed. And he went up on stage, I remember, and he gave a toast. And he gave a little speech and talked very enthusiastically and very, very eloquently uh, and thanked everyone and all this and that. And he said, now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome up a great actor, entertainer, but, you know, someone that really knows about politics, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Now, he, of course, didn't tell me at all that he's going to call me up, or do you mind if I have you come up and say a few words? <laughs> I mean, nothing. So uh, it was the last thing uh, that I was, you know, kind of ready for. But for some reason or the other, um, the more organic you are, the better chance you have to shine. So I just basically told the people, as if mean, the only thing I can really say at this point is to tell them the story, how I became a, 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 a fan of Nixon and told them the story about the campaign and how I watched him every day when he was campaigning and his speeches and this and that and Humphreys and, and, and kind of told it so, and it was a huge applause. And then afterwards he came to me and says, I'm telling you Arnold, if you ever run, I would endorse you. You know, and it was like, uh, it was like kind of like, I said to myself, this is unbelievable. And then he signed, he, he sent me photographs, uh, you know, that we took together at the Nixon Library. I remember Bob Hope was also there and other celebrities and he would sign it and I still have the photograph in my office. Tell about uh, your meeting with then White House Deputy Chief of Staff Karl Rove where uh, you were innocently asking about uh, the governorship and then the later time you ran into him after you were elected. Well, um, I started thinking more and more in the late 90s, early 2000s about the idea of running. Gray Davis uh, was just elected uh, to be our governor and all that stuff. So it was kind of brewing in my head. And so all of a sudden was the uh, talk about a recall in California to recall Gray Davis. He was now elected the second time. And uh, as soon as he was elected, you know, there were, of course, economic downturns, which, you know, is no one's fault, really, not one person's fault. Uh, but then the lights went out in California, and, uh, you know, so people felt like, oh, what kind of a governor do we have? The economy is going down, we cannot even keep our lights on. It was all kinds of things that started mounting to anger in California. And uh, all of a sudden, there was a recall. Now, I was just finished off Terminator 3, and I was now about to go on a promotion to a worldwide to promote the movie Terminator 3. And as I was traveling around, I read the news, it's just that there's gathering signatures and they're now having enough signatures and they're now uh, giving, sending it to the Secretary of State and the Secretary of State is calling now for an election, for a recall election. So that was basically, I said to myself, that is a clear signal from somewhere above that if I want to run, this is the time to run because you have Democrats and Republicans voting together. And I don't have to go through a, a Republican primary. And so I jumped into the race. And you see, but you go to see Karl Rove? Well, what happened is, is that 
before all this, since I was very heavily involved in after school programs. So we had a big after school program summit in Washington. So which was, you know, kind of worked together. We worked together, me and the Bush administration uh, worked on this after school program summit. And so it was natural that afterwards I went over there with the Secretary of Education appointed by Bush to go with the White House with her and to just drop by and say hi to the president and also then to go upstairs and say hi to Karl Rove. And uh, so I said to Karl Rove, so tell me, I mean, this whole thing now, they're gathering signatures, uh, do you think they're talking about the recall, do you think this is gonna happen? And he says to me, you know, Donald, they're a crazy in California. California does crazy things. I mean, I wouldn't count on that at all. I mean, they talk about it and this and that. It's a wacky state. No one is going to recall Great Davis. It's, it's the craziest thing. I said, so, so I wouldn't even pay much attention to that. Now, this is the, the number one expert in politics talking. And uh, I said to myself, I don't know why he's saying that, because it seems to me that the feeling I get in California that people really want to have the recall. Why is he so often that one? So it didn't take long. We are schmoozing upstairs in his office, and he says now, he says, um, oh, let's go downstairs. I just got the message. Let's go downstairs. You will meet someone that will be really an interesting candidate for 2006. That if you, by the way, uh, if you ever want to run, that will be the candidate that you have to beat. So we go downstairs, and then all of a sudden, there's Condoleezza Rice, Secretary of State, coming our way. And she's all smiley and very friendly. And I say, hey, Arnold, how are you? It's good to see you. And I said, uh, you know, thank you. It's nice to see you also. I said, uh, you know, congratulations on a great job that you're doing and all this. And Carl Rove says, that is the candidate for 2006. That is the person that you would have to beat if you happen to want to run. She was totally uncomfortable. So she did not know that he's going to say that. I mean, she's a you know, wonderful, sweet woman and very smart and everything. And she would make a great governor. There's no two ways about that. And would have been a tough contender, obviously. But he had no idea that my thinking was, I'm going to run Carl. I'm going to run way before 2006. And I will prove to you how off you are. And true enough, a few months later, I was governor of the state of California. They called the election in, in, uh, in, in August, beginning of August. On August 6th, I announced on the Tonight Show with Jay Leno my candidacy. And then exactly two months later, on October 7th, I was governor of the state of California and then sworn in on November 17th of 2003. And fast forward to the next time you see him. President Bush came out to California to visit and uh, maybe to do some fundraising, whatever. But I remember they asked me to meet up with uh, President Bush uh, in the Inland Empire. And he was staying there at a hotel and they asked me to go up there to this hotel. And so I then met Bush, who I knew very well, uh, because, I, like I said, from Camp David, and for, you know, we hung out together a lot of times. But he then said to Carl Rove, he says, Carl, why don't you leave us alone? And so Carl Rove walked out, okay, bye, you know, kind of sheepishly. And uh, he left. And then I talked to Bush for a while, and then Bush said to me, basically, you know, hey, don't hold any crutches against Karl Rove because he didn't, you know, believe that this would happen. I say, are you kidding me? I say, I love the guy. I think he has done the most unbelievable job for you. I said, and that he didn't believe in it. I said, a lot of other people didn't believe that there would be a recall. And a lot of other people didn't believe that I would be running for governor or that I would be governor eventually and all that stuff. I said, I have nothing against Carl. You can bring him back. So anyway, he came back, and then we all were laughing and having a good time. And like I said, you know, we had a wonderful working relationship after that when I was uh, governor, and Carl was very supportive, and 
the president was very supportive and all that. Explain how the narrative uh, within your family changed from the first time you brought up the possibility of running with your wife when you were both were in the jacuzzi to then day of Jay Leno. Well, it was, um, I did not know after all of the years of knowing Maria that how much she in a way despised politics. So all of this started unfolding kind of when I told her uh, in a jacuzzi, I said to her, I said, you know, what do you think about the idea of me running for governor? Very casual question. And she said, you know, he would look at me like the bottom just fell out. And um, she says, you're not thinking about that, huh? Are you? And I said, yeah, I was thinking about it. I said, look, I said, this is such chaos in California. I said, the politicians are such idiots. I said, look what they do with the state. This is the number one state, the number one place in the world. They're destroying it. I say, I feel that I can do a better job than they do. I don't have the experience or anything like this, I said, but I can do a better job than they do. I say, I feel inside me that I have to go and do that. And she just freaked out. And so then I said, well, look, I don't want to cause a scene or anything like this. You know, uh, if, if it's so upsetting, I just forget about the whole idea. And, uh, but yeah, so then there was the, always the idea that, that, that Dick Reardon is going to run and he's going to go and represent the Republican Party. And but the bottom line was uh, that, uh, you know, Maria then, you know, changed her mind and she thought, you know, she shouldn't be in my way. And I remember that morning before I went to the night show, she left a message and says, you know, if you want to run, it's okay. I understand. Here's what you should say if you want to run. And here's what you should say if you don't want to run. And had you really not made up your mind? No. What happened was we had meetings with Dick Reardon about it, and he then all of a sudden, what really tipped it, the whole thing was, that Dick Reardon said, I don't have the fire in the belly. I think you should run. So that's when I kind of came back with my thought. And that's just when I said to Maria, I said, look, he's not going to run. And so anyway, so the whole thing, I, I went into the night show, and there I announced exactly what was really in me, which was that I have to run, that I have to jump in no matter what happens. And so when I came home that night after the, the night show, I didn't see my wife the whole day. She was out filming and doing her, because she was having her own show on NBC and doing an interview with somebody. And uh, so I didn't really talk to her the whole day. So she had no idea which way I'm going to go. And so anyway, under the night show I announced. And so of course her friends that worked under the, the, at the NBC over there called her immediately a second later she knew. And by the time I came home, she was like freaking out. So I said to myself, this is beyond me, beyond my comprehension. Because I now, for the first time, really did not understand life. I said, how could someone grow up in a family, in a political family, and um, not like the idea of their husband running for governor? But I was only thinking about the one dimension. But the other dimension that I did not think about was, was that she, as a child, was dragged along to all those political campaigns if she wanted it or not. So she hated it. And she hated that she never really had the ultimate privacy, that everything was always reported. How much money they spent, what they did on the weekend, and this and that. And she was dragged with all the other kids uh, in front of the press. So, but I, that ne never was really explained to me uh, so that I knew that. So then later on, as time went on, I think she, uh, Maria, articulated that much better. And then I understood why there was pain and why there was discomfort. And she felt like, you know, who knows what stuff will come out. And everyone has skeletons in the closet. And I don't want to be embarrassed again, like I was with my family and this whole thing, you know, with uh, whatever, you know, they discovered whenever any one of the family members ran. So it was always embarrassing, and so which I totally understood. But at that point, I uh, felt like quite the opposite. Because I said to myself, whatever they find, 
I take that risk and I'm going to dive in. It was all or nothing. At this point, it felt like it's all or nothing. And I felt so convinced that I need to be and have to be the governor. And this is exactly the way it all played out. You wrote in your book, being governor was more complex and challenging than you imagined. In what ways? Well, because the only time you find out how complex the job is is when you sit there. And there's no training class for being governor. Even when you're a state senator, even when you're lieutenant governor, you really never know until you sit there and until you really get hit by challenges that are unexpected. Because remember that uh, we uh, were hit by a second recession with a much, within a much shorter period of time than it normally happens. Normally it's like 10 years or so. If within six years, I mean, we, we balanced our budget in 2006, and in 2007 we saw the revenues going down. By 2008 we were $20 billion short of revenues. So to then figure out what to do, and as a state you cannot have a, a, a uh, deficit. You have to somehow balance the budget. So we always end you have $20 billion short this year, $20 billion the next year, $20 billion the next. So you're getting into a disastrous situation. So there were tremendous challenges that I faced. Also, when you get phone calls at uh, 9 in the evening that we have 500 fires all over the state. And then you get another phone call at 3 in the morning that now there's 1,500 fires. And then at, uh, when you get up in the morning, you get another phone call and says, now we have 2,013 fires in California all at one time. And you know that your resources are not available to have 2,013 fires. So that's when you really have to, uh, you discover kind of like, this is complicated. And, uh, but with a good team and with uh, a lot of guts, you know, you make decisions very quickly and you uh, have good partners like we had with the federal government and the military and the National Guard and everyone coming together. So there were a lot of challenges like that. Uh, you know, and I remember the first, after a year and a half of being in office, I called a special election to solve some of the major fiscal problems that we had in California and some of the problems we had with the education. And um, I lost, I remember, all four of the initiatives that I put on the ballot. So that was kind of also a huge beating because labor raised $167 million and we raised only 87. So there's wild stuff like that that went down. But then a year later, I came back and I won the governorship again. And also it was like, it's kind of like, you know, some days it's fantastic and everything goes well and you balance the budget and you have the, made a deal with Democrats and Republicans to build the infrastructure and to pass great environmental laws. And we passed the most unbelievable environmental laws. We became kind of the example for the rest of the world uh, and, and all this. So I mean, there's wonderful things and then there's also tough times. And so I experienced both, but I would not ever uh, exchange it with anything else. It was the most uh, challenging, but the most rewarding and pleasurable thing to do. It was, I, I, I have to tell you that I'm so fortunate that in my life I was able, out of all of the things, to be a bodybuilding champion and a movie star and all this kind of stuff, but that I was able to serve, you know, almost 40 million people in California. That was like unbelievable. Our visit to Hong Kong coincided with the debut of the Arnold Sports Festival in Asia, the sixth and final continent the event has reached since starting in 1989. The weekend featured 5,000 athletes in 28 different sports from nearly 50 countries and continues Schwarzenegger's mission to spread fitness and nutrition awareness throughout the world. What's most impressed you about the growth of the Arnold Classics over the years? Well, you know, you have a vision and promoting bodybuilding. But then out of that, the, 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 the vision got bigger. The same as if I should not just promote bodybuilding. I should promote fitness, I should promote health. But the work has to continue on because the, those fitness festivals have to get bigger and bigger. And uh, you know, uh, as I always say, too big is not big enough.
This is really so exciting for me and for the Arnold Classic to be here in Hong Kong and to finally be here in Asia. What do you think of the first one in Hong Kong so far? Well, it's, it's great. The idea is to walk and to watch the different sports and the different activities they're doing because it makes them feel good if I come by and watch them and I'm aware of what they're doing and all this. It's all part of it. Nice. Oh, man, that is too easy. And watch those arms and the shoulders. Look at the technique. Go! Come on! You got it. Look at this. Yes. Bravo. Bravo. Very nice. Nice. I do a lot of times when I go to the Arnold Classics, I walk around and show them that I'm interested in what they're doing in whatever the sport it is, boxing or a jumping rope or pole dancing or whatever it may be. Let's see a pose. I mean, come on, indulge me a little bit here. Yeah, look at this. Nice. Can you believe that, how quickly those guys are? Look at how agile. Man, I would love to be able to do just 10% of this. Wow. Okay, you can do it. Faster. Yes. Oh, man, you're going 30 miles an hour. You're going up to 40 miles an hour. Unbelievable, man. Fantastic. Give me five. Congratulations, and I hope that you say, I'll be back. I'll be back. Very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you.